So, as with many problems uh, in Bangalore, there's a schizophrenia to it. Those who are connected to the water lines of the Kaveri, there are 1.1 million connections of the Kaveri, and uh, the BWSSB pumps in 1,470 million liters per day. There's some amount of losses, 27%. For those 1.1 million connections, it's not really a crisis. There's a tightening of the belt, there's no crisis. There's a, another 25 to 30% of the population which is dependent on groundwater either through their own bore wells or through the tankers that supply them. For them, there's a limited amount of crisis, uh, especially in the periphery, there's a crisis uh, which is there not now but for the last three months. So, a city of 70%, not much crisis, 30% crisis. So what happened in Cape Town was that the reservoir supplying water to the city of Cape Town actually started to deplete and go dry. For us in Bangalore, we are dependent on four reservoirs. Actually, two of them directly supplied to us, the KRS and Kabini. In addition, there's a backup with the Himavati and the Harangi, right? Now, if you take a look at the KSNDMC website of today, www.ksndmc.org, it tells us that there's about 43 TMC feet of water, right? So the dams are not going to go dry till July, right? We will need about 10.8 TMC feet of water. Uh, that includes the, some of the losses in the river and some tap by Mandia and Mysore, uh, which includes the 1,470 million liters per day being pumped in into the city and the additional 775, which will come as part of the recovery fifth stage. If you put both together, we need about 10.8 TMC feet. So there's enough and more water in the reservoir. If you use it judiciously, and that's, not, that's out of the question. But yes, for the groundwater dependent part of the city, we'll have to find solutions quickly. It, like many things uh, in life, it's fuzzy and it's complex, right? One of the reasons why there's a crisis in uh, the eastern part of the city or the southeastern part of the city is because Bellandur and Vartur have been drained and are being desilted over the last five years. These are huge volume lakes, 364 hectares in water spread for uh, Bellandur and nearly 200 for Vartur. Enormous holding capacities. If they had even sewage in them, they would have recharged the groundwater and it may have been non-portable water, but water would have been available in the tankers. So this is a sort of classic trap that we've fallen, that the Kaveri fifth stage got delayed. If it were implemented correctly and had been done one year back, we would not have had a crisis. If the lakes had been desilted on time and were full of water, both rainwater or treated wastewater, there would not have been a crisis. So this is the perfect storm for Bangalore. What will happen is that the 775 MLD will kick in from the Kaveri and so therefore part of the pressure will be assuaged and if the rains are good as it's being predicted, uh, then even the lakes will fill up. So then we will forget about it and talk about floods. Rainwater harvesting would have solved part of the problem, uh, not all of the problem, right? Uh, it is important that citizens can get involved in rainwater harvesting and do it as per the law, right? So it's a question of citizen action, inaction, as much as the incapacity of our citizens to behave maturely as a, a democratic, uh, responsible citizen, right? So we always expect the danda on us for us to con conform to laws. We are not persuaded by arguments of 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 partnership, right? So we just have about 1.8 million rainwater harvesting structures of which quite a few would be dysfunctional. Whereas we should have had at least 10 million structures, if not 20 million, which are the properties that are there in Bangalore. So rainwater harvesting, even if done properly, would not have completely eliminated this problem. Because the rains, the last rains came in November. We have had a long period of dry, dryness. The real reason in my opinion, is the lake's desilting got stuck in a quagmire of indecision. Plus, we did something called bypassing the drains, you know, uh, the raw sewage that flows in the stormwater drain. So, we create a bypass channel and push it off to the next uh, drain. This means that even when the small rains come, they also get bypassed. Now, the only water that falls in the lake is what falls as rain. And the only other place that we are able to mm, use the lakes Effectively, it's like in Nagara, where there's a 30 MLD, 31 MLD wastewater treatment plant of the BWSSB, where treated wastewater is pushed into Agara, or Saraki Lake, or Jakkur Lake, right? So lakes which are receiving treated wastewater are the only ones which are full.
So again, these are sort of really complex issues and there are no simple answers. I'll try to tell you what's happening. There are 34 wastewater treatment plants of the BWSSB now, 34. There were 36, two of them are being repaired, right? Small lake-based ones, 34 wastewater treatment plants. They're capable of treating roughly 1,440 million liters per day, roughly. There's a small uh, figure that has to be adjusted, of which they are receiving 1,059 million liters per day, right? So they're getting 1,015 milliliters per day. Now, they were getting water and we're treating it to a certain standard as prescribed by the CPCB before the NGT ruling. The NGT cracked down in the Belandur and Vartur case and said, you have to up your treatment. You have to get BOD, which is a parameter, down to 10. You have to remove phosphates, get it less than 1. Nitrates have to get less than 10. These are really stringent standards, right? Now, before that, wastewater treatment plants were not functioning all that good. But they were functioning good enough for it to be transported to Kolar and Chikbalapur, where that water is needed for agriculture purpose. So it fills the lakes, recharges the aquifer, and it's available for agricultural purpose, right? That water actually needed nutrients in it. It needed nitrates and phosphates because then farmers need less fertilizers. Now what's happened because of the NGT order is we are stripping it of all nutrients, taking away the phosphate, taking away the nitrates, and then pushing really pure water uh, to our lakes and to other places. So the BWSSB is invest, investing something like 1,600 crores in upgrading the STPs to get to tertiary standards. In that process, what's happened is some of the STPs like Jakkur, Kaban Park, V Valley 150 MLD, huh, some of them actually can drink from the treat, wastewater treatment plant. That's the level of treatment that they have taken it. But that water is being mixed with untreated sewage in the lakes or in the British Bhakti in the Dakshin Pinakini. So it's a complex story. Some of it is going to Kolar and Chikbalapur and is helping the farmers there albeit with all the controversies that there are. But I think we need to negotiate a space where the wastewater will also be available for Bangalore. Now, everything is booked for Kolar and Chikbalapur. Now, the BWSSB is making arrangements to take 20% of, of the treated wastewater for ourselves. An ideal plan would have filled all the 186 lakes of Bangalore. Of the 210 lakes, we have 186 are live lakes. We would have filled them. Therefore, the aquifers would have recharged to varying degrees. Not all lakes recharge uniformly. They all recharge differently, but they do do the job of recharge. So it's a negotiation of a wastewater policy, which would take care of the needs of Kolar, Chikbalapur, Anikal, Ramnagram, etc., etc., Bangalore Rural and the city of Bangalore. We don't have a wastewater reuse policy. We have a wastewater treatment policy. So we have to change our imagination on that. So they're not saying that they let out. See, here's the thing. Uh, what they're saying now, which is what they should say, is suppose you have an apartment coming up, which is nowhere near a BWSB sewage line. Then that apartment has to have its own treatment plant or otherwise it'll end up polluting the drains and the lakes nearby, right? What is the scale at which you mandate the sewage treatment plant? Previously, it was 20 units, 20 flats you had to mandate it. Now, many of these flats have these sewage treatment plants. They're dysfunctional. They don't run because the builder does not see any incentive in investing money in this sewage treatment plant. It becomes the association's responsibility to run it. So here's a value. Suppose the BWSSB line comes to your flat. Are you better off in connecting it to the BWSSB line or you still want to, as per the law, get the apartment to run it? So I think the wire media that's been found is that if you're close to a BWSSB line, get connected to that line. You have a choice. If you want to run your own STP, do so by any means. There's no ban on it. But if you're not running it well, then connect it to the BWSSB line. The challenge is the BWSSB line is not near you. What do you do? And that's a tricky phase. I think we we'll have to negotiate that very carefully. So a lot of them have become dysfunctional. Um, but then, thanks to the Manwadars and thanks to their memory of their fathers, grandfathers, knowing the wells in Maleshwaram, Baswaswar Nagar, Baswan Godi, all those places, many of them have been cleaned up. Many of them are back in business. Many of them are being recharged with rooftop rainwater. Some community wells are being cleaned up now, like recently in Kothanur Lake and uh, Anjanapura Lake, next to that, two, two wells have been cleaned up and they've been disinfected and the local community goes to that well and draws the water and makes good use of it, a poor communities, right? Like that, we believe that there must be close to between 10 to 12,000 old open wells which have been reinvigorated. Plus, there are now... It's only in Bangalore or 
mostly in Bangalore, especially old Bangalore, like Rajajinagar, Jainagar, Pasangodi, city market, all those areas. A lot of this also means that if a well is reinvigorated in a house, and if the BWSSP comes to know that you have a bill, then you are charged 100 rupees a month, as sanitary says. Okay. So people hide it, they don't reveal it, yeah, but they're using it. Yeah. So this is the sort of uh, paradoxical policies which should encourage rainwater harvesting and rejuvenation of well and treat the well water as a substitute for cavity water. But the argument of the BWSSB is that you're taking the water and pushing it our sewage line, so therefore you pay a sanitary cess. So we have to negotiate that. So many wells are being rejuvenated. As part of the policy, recharge wells are being dug. The Manwater community, in their opinion, and we gather information from them, have dug 250,000 recharge wells. Uh, about 80 in Kaban Park, about 300 in Lal Bagh, and so on and so forth, right? And in all the parks. So that movement is on, and it has to spread even more. A million is not enough. Wherever there has been a concentrated application of recharge wells, it shows immediate impact in that area immediately. Like, for example, rail wheel factory in Yalanka, they cleaned it up, six open wells, they put in rainwater next to it into a wetland. Three lakh liters of water per day, they're take, getting from the open wells. IAM did it on a concentrated basis. They did about 48 or 49 recharge wells. Now they want to do another 20. Their groundwater table has come up. Their bore wells are sufficient for their water supply. So wherever we are able to identify a sub-aquifer and do it in a rigorous fashion, there the results are more prominent. But when you disperse it, it takes time for that result to come up. However, we must also balance demand and supply. It can't be that just because you recharge, you can draw unlimited water, right? So that trade-off has to be worked. very severe. However, wherever the treated wastewater is going to Kolar and Chikbalapur, in Kolar they are filling 147 lakes, Chikbalapur 64 lakes, there the groundwater table is high and there is no crisis, right? So we need to work on treated wastewater as a resource. We need to focus on making sure that the quality of treatment is good and that it's capable of refilling our lakes as much as possible through a process of wetland rejuvenation. So the crisis otherwise is terrible. It's really bad. The drought is, uh, is really severe and we are struggling. We have 36,000 lakes in uh, our tanks in Karnataka, right? We ran a program called the Jal Samvardhane Yojana in 2008, if you remember, with World Bank assistance. We, Madan Gopal sir was the director. And we desilted close to 3,900 tanks. And not only that, we cleaned up the catchment, the feeder channels, we formed tank user groups, made sure that tank user groups uh, ran those tanks. And it was transferred to the tank user group locally. We completely forgot about it. We don't even remember what JSY is. Jal Sambardhani and the no that's what the question people ask. But those tanks, some of them still survive because the catchment is good. There's no encroachment on the feeder channels or on the tank and water comes in. We need a JSYS2 for our 36,000 tanks if we want to be drought proofing ourselves. That's one beginning. That's the beginning that we need to do. Then, of course, for urban areas, we need uh, more strategies. One strategy which we need very quickly is for institutions to develop the capacity to understand groundwater better, to draw up an aquifer management plan, and to make sure that we recharge our aquifers and regulate the drawl from bore wells. The BWSSB did not have a single hydrogeologist, even till now. The chairman has now recently decided that they'll create a groundwater cell. We need to create that double quick time. We need to draw up groundwater management plans for all our cities and towns. There's funding available from Amrut too. If we take that and we make sure that groundwater fixes in into our solution and treated wastewater fixes it into our solution, then we start to drought proof ourselves and climate proof ourselves. terrible. Even now as we speak, even now when we realize that water is so precious in Yelemala Pachati, they're dumping construction debris. In other lakes, builders are dumping soil and moving it. That, after all the attention from everybody, activists, court, media, that our lakes are still in such a terrible shape is heartbreaking. Will we ever learn? I, in this matter, I think you are more an expert than I am. I think I, I'm, I'm not sure that the political economy has been fixed. The real estate value is so tremendously high that 
uh, vested interests are capable of running roughshod over the institutions which are in charge of our, our tanks. And, and that's a real tragedy because if we don't protect our tanks, we are doomed. So, Dr. TV Ramchandra's report, other reports have shown that the Kaveri catchment, the forests are in steep decline. The old growth forests are all going and uh, the condition of the soil is also deteriorating and flows are deteriorating. We need to worry about the, about the basin. The climate change models, however, predict a 5% increase in rainfall in the Kaveri basin. Now, this is a double whammy because the increased rainfall will occur in a shorter duration of time and the forest will not be capable of holding on to it for long. Therefore, we'll end up with silt in our reservoirs and then the waters will run off, right? So, what has happened in, with us is with our obsession with local lakes, we've not bothered about the fact that it's Kaveri which gives us water. Without Kaveri, Bangalore cannot survive. And Bangalore's responsibility is to the Kaveri catchment. We only obsess with our uh, kereks. We need to worry about Kodugu and um, Hassan and Hemavati and Chikmaglur and make sure that those old growth forests, the old forests, whatever remains of them are protected. That's Bangalore's responsibility. But we don't have a river basin institution. We don't have a river basin management plan. We only have water extraction plans. So unless we create the right institution at that level to start to monitor. I'll give you a parallel example of what we can do. We created the Karnataka State Natural Disaster Monitoring Center, KSNDMC. One of the best institutions in the country. No other state has the equivalent of a gram panchayat level automatic weather station. In Bangalore, 99 automatic weather stations, which gives you granular data on mega sandesha as to what is the rainfall there, what's there. They're able to track weather and climate to that granularity, which then therefore prepares us to draw up action plan, plans better. We need to create that kind of a river basin institution for Kaveri in Karnataka. So that's the negative dividend of democracy in which you run a five-year cycle where you want to please your vote bank and then the 25-year cycle of protection of nature and sustainability. So hypocrisy is part of the overall game that we are playing as in the name of development, right? So the challenge before us as thinkers and policymakers is how do we control this negative dividend of democracy and how do we make sure that we really are focused on the long-term goal? And that's a very difficult thing to do. What happens is that, of course, if groundwater runs out, you can give as many subsidy as much as you want for pumps at what, when there's no water there at all, what will you do, right? So, like I said, we need to go away from competitive drilling to cooperative filling. We have to start to see how we can push people to put more water into the aquifer rather than to push people to draw more water from whatever is non-existent and already at the groundwater level. That's our challenge. So, it's a ecologically a disastrous project. We've already invested 20,000 crores or thereabouts, right? So, and there's not a drop of water that's come to us. I mean, ecologically destructive projects are not the solution for us. We have to look at local waters and local protection and live within whatever nature gives us. These transfers over large distance or even the Meke Dadu project is, in my opinion, disastrous. We should not be even thinking about it. Because now I'm Ganda the Gudi and the Matarti, Kanada the Hard, Helter, Dr. Rajkumar Sahib Rumi, Ah, Ganda the Gudi, Niran, Haki, Ella, Moluksi, Anigal, and Ella, who we want to chase the elephants away. And we don't see the irony in it. We don't see it as our forest being lost or our uh, trees being cut. We see water for Bangalore and electricity for Bangalore. Uh, it's quite uh, unfortunate. We have been allocated 284.75 TMC feet by the Supreme Court, 284.75 feet. How much are we taking now? 19 TMC feet, 6.67% of Karnataka's allocation of Kaveri waters. With the additional 775 MLD, we will take another 11 TMC feet, 30 TMC feet. Our Deputy Chief Minister is saying another 6 TMC feet is available. 30 TMC feet, which is 11% of Karnataka's allocation of Kaveri waters, 11%. And I keep reminding you, that water comes in the morning. Six o'clock, it's pumped from Torekad in early, lands at uh, Jainagar Rose Garden, then gets all to the reservoir, comes to my house at 7.30 in the morning. I have a shower. By nine o'clock, it's in the sewage treatment plant. By 11.30, it's in Kolar. Bangalore is making just a pit stop for the Kaveri. It's a complete non-consumptive use. If we design our systems well to collect all the wastewater, not a drop will be consumed in Bangalore. What Bangalore does is add 600 million litres of groundwater, which goes as wastewater. It's treated in these 34 
future 59 wastewater treatment plants shipped away to Kolar Chikbalapur for farmers to use. The city is the most efficient user of water. It uses less water than any other form of agriculture or other uses, right? So, so therefore, there is enough and more in the Kaveri for us. Question to ask ourselves, are we happy to send uh, 2 crore liters per hectare of sugarcane? Or the 2 crore liters supports a sum of uh, slum population of 2000 for the whole year? That's the decision we have to make. There's enough and more water in the Kaveri with the existing reservoirs if we manage it well and take our, for ourselves. And if we um, do that without any future dams. One of the most wonderful things that we can do is to set up a rainwater harvesting system at a school, government schools. We are doing that in many of the government schools. Put them, give them a rain gauge, give them a water quality testing kit. Six, seventh, eight standard kids with the help of the teacher, check whether the water is potable or not potable. What does water quality mean? How much rainfall does occur? How much are we entitled to? It's such a beautiful, elegant tool for education of water, water literacy, at the same time functional. It gives you a lot of water for sanitation use, for other uses. So we must launch this education program for children at a mass level, especially during these times of crisis, make them aware of how much are we entitled to? Right? As, as citizens. And so many, I'll just give you one example, Finn, because you asked and this is a favorite of mine. In Paugada, where there's fluoride, in one school many years back, eight years back, the children collected samples from about 10 villages because they would all come and cycle to that one major school in a village from various sources in the village. They mapped it. They tested it for fluoride with the help of their teacher. They created a map of all the sources with fluoride. They told the villagers back, this is a source, this hand pump has fluoride, this one does not have. They made the map and sent it to the DC. The DC sent government officials to say, hey, look, you must set up RO plants or do something for fluoride mitigation. This is the power of educating uh, school children in a practical sense about their day to day uh, um, engagement with water. Allah. So there are such possibilities which exist if we have the imagination. So again, private tankers is a construct of state failure. Because the state does not give water in pipe network, you dig your own bore well. Your bore well runs dry, you have to depend on tanker water. And you're building apartments which provide lots of load on the groundwater system. So it's clearly a state failure. How do we see private water tankers? The way it operates is it operates as a market economy, right? The way to control cartelization, mafia, and price rise is competition. Contrary wise, you need more private tankers in the market if you want the prices down. Or the government should in increase supply with its own tankers of Kaveri water and push it so that the prices come down and it reaches the poorest. Otherwise, the prices go up. So you identify sources of groundwater availability, which is sustainable. You recharge the lake and you tell the private uh, guys, you come, you must drill your borewell here. You must pay us 5 rupees a kiloliter or 10 rupees a kiloliter. Take as much as you want and give it to the people. Instead of saying that I'll cap the price and regulate it, which is the old way of uh, dealing with things, right? But if you don't have the equivalent of a competitions commission of India, those people who are skilled in understanding markets and how to manage markets, if you have water guys running it, you will mismanage the market with great skill, to use Bob Dylan's language. But unfortunately, we're 350 kilometers from the sea on either side. Mangalore or Chennai, right? So we can only get it from Mangalore. If we desalinate it, the price of desalinated water at the coast itself is 40 rupees a kiloliter. Then we have to pump it up over the Western Ghats and then down again into Bangalore. It will be astronomically expensive and it will emit a lot of carbon monoxide and consume a lot of energy. Unfortunately, desalinization is for the coastal belt, not for cities which are at 920 meters above sea level. But that will reduce the stress. There's enough and more here to reduce the stress. We don't have to worry too much about stress. I'll give you a water balance. We're getting 2,270 million liters from the Kaveri in the next three months. 2,270 million liters per day. We got groundwater, which is 600 million liters per day. We got rainwater, which is about 500 million liters per day. And treated wastewater, which is 2,000 million liters per day. If you add it all together, it's 5,000 million liters per day. There's enough and more for a population of at least, at least 40 million people. If we manage it well, we don't have to go far. We don't have to go to Yatinole, we don't have to go to desalination. We can do with whatever we have right now. But then we have to set ourselves the goal that we will manage groundwater better, we will manage wastewater better, and we, we shall re recycle it and drop that plan. 
The only plants we now have are to ship water from Kaveri, from Mekedatu, from here, from Lingan Makki, we'll get Yatin Hole. That's our plan. Our plan is not on recycling, not on harvesting, not on groundwater management. No, it's already invested a lot of money. VWCSP has invested money, set up a water treatment plant for 135 million liters per day from the uh, Tipgoda Nali. What they're doing is they're expecting the Yatinhole project to come and fill it with 4 TMC feet of water, right? And then it brings uh, the water to us. Now, Yatinhole may come, 220 <laughs> kilometers may come, it may come to Tipgoda Nali. That's the way things work, right? But we have a smarter thing to do right now. We have a 150 MLD plant at V Valley, which actually is treating wastewater to the highest standards. If you pick that and fill Arkavati, Timkona Nali, 8 kilometers upstream, allow it to flow, cascade, improve, put a wetland and get it into the uh, uh, Timkona Nali, add the natural rain that comes in and the Yatin Nole water, if at all comes in, we have 135 MLD for our city in addition to the Kaveri. So there was a program that a uh, Singaporean company had taken up that prepared a DPR, but then it takes one bureaucrat or one minister to say, I don't like this idea and then everything is torpedo. Nothing is si studied scientifically, nothing is done in consultation with people, nothing is done where there's a democratic consensus on decision making. So we already have a report on that. All we need is to just execute it. We have underinvested in the institution consistently. What happened when Mr. Vidya Shankar was uh, the chairman at a point of time, we were planning to take some assistance from World Bank and they did a parametric uh, measure of how many employees are needed per thousand connections of water and so on and so forth. So they put a cap on recruitment. Right? That was when the city was fast exploding. That was when you needed good engineers in the BWSSB with human resources to be able to plan holistically. I think we don't look at the human resource and the well-roundedness of BWSSB. One example is, we don't have hydrogeologists there, so groundwater does not exist for the BWSSB. We don't have a social development unit, so slums don't exist for the BWSSB. In, in a fashion where you organize and work with slum dwellers, get community contact and improve it. We forgot to do that uh, in terms of blending it and making it a robust institution with a good chief officer who has a long term, you know, not IS officers who go every two years or three years. We forgot to do that. Then we are not looking at the financial strength. Uh, so we depend on JICA to give us 5,800 crores or 6,000 crores to invest capital uh, cost. If we don't have money in that begging bowl, we are not able to do any operations and maintenance or capital expenditure. Unless the BWSSB is financially viable and sustainable, it cannot perform the humongous task it's asked to perform. And it cannot perform with the kind of staff that it has. We must strengthen the BWSSB to the extent possible. So you have to tell me where the buck stops, yeah. right? Because look at what the institution's responsibility is. BWSSB, Kaveri Water Supply and Sewerage Board. That's what some people call it. Not Bangalore Water Supply Sewerage Board, Kaveri Water Supply Sewerage Board. Lakes, BBNP, KTCDA, right? Groundwater, Groundwater Authority, Wastewater, Minor Irrigation Department, which is sending it to Kolar and Chikpalapur. Where is the total institutional plan for water for the city? Now you tell me who is responsible. Would you hold BWSSP responsible for, or us responsible that we have not created an integrated institution which is in charge of all waters? We were smart enough to create the first parastatal in India in 1964, Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Board. No other city in India had a specialized institution. We did that in 1964. But we have a 20th century institution dealing with the 21st century problem. We need to be quickly active to create a 21st century institution which is responsible for all waters. Then we can hold them accountable. First, empower them, give them the weapons to be able to deal with the situation, then get them accountable. So very quickly and very easily to do is to create a groundwater cell, man or human resource it with, uh, man is a lousy gender word, uh, uh, with uh, at least competent hydrogeologists who are able to drop a groundwater management plan for the city. So bring all the groundwater regulations, refilling, use and price into play. Create a wastewater reuse cell where you have specialists who know 
how the treatment plants, the 59 wastewater treatment plants will need to operate, what quality and what reliability, and how they will be reused for Bangalore first, and then for the district second. If we do these two things together, groundwater and wastewater reuse, we have action. And it will not take anything much. It, it will need just about something like 20 people to be able to start to do this. I'm an eternal optimist, Nidra. So this has been a story since 1854, where always water is short in this city. And it's a tragedy of human epic proportions. In 1875, 76, 77, 1875, 76, 77, there was a great drought. The population of Bangalore was one and a half lakh. There was such a bara that one lakh people died in the old Mysore kingdom, of which many of them died in the city because they all came from Ballari, Kolar, Chikbalapur for food here, and they died. At that time, the, the city ruler said, the local lakes are not enough for our requirement. That famous thousand lakes of Bangalore was not enough to support a population of 1.8 lakhs if you have three years of drought. How that? Then we went to Hesargatta and it became Tipugunda Nadli and Kaveri and now whatever, Yatinole and all that. So the, the question is, the moment water came, the population exploded. <laughs> Grew to drink that water, then water shortage, then more water, then drink. But do you think that urbanization can be controlled? In the capitalist mode of economy that we have, in the brand Bangalore we build, in the economy that India aspires, 7.5-8% GDP, we cannot limit Bangalore's growth. I'm an old Bangalorean, I would want the Bangalore of 70s and 80s to be back. But uh, to be a realist, we need to deal with growth. We need to say, what do we need to make sure that these, there's no stress for water? For example, all the lakes outside the BMA area, Gunjur Gogi, Sarjapura, or you go to north, Devanadi and beyond, there are multi-story buildings coming up. Betkote Kere, Dodbad Bangla, all those lakes need to be protected now. All those lakes needed to be filled with uh, rainwater and treated wastewater now. Then we have a sustainable plan. Otherwise, So you know that for three years they've sent a proposal to the state government, it's not there. See, the BWSSB's calculation says that it takes 42 rupees to get a kiloliter of water to us. That's o and cost. They're not calculating capital cost. They're not calculating debt servicing. They're not calculating a sinking fund, which you need to create to replace old pipes and old machinery, right? If you add all that together, it's 95 rupees a kiloliter, 1,000 liters, 95 rupees. I'm in a domestic house. I pay 7 rupees a kiloliter, first slab, 11 rupees a kiloliter, second slab. If I take 20,000 liters of water, I get a subsidy of 1,650 rupees a month. A month. Better than all those five guarantees I'm getting already. I've been getting for a long, long time. Whole sum of it. Can the city afford it? Can the utilities afford it? Those who go and protest and say Balandur and Vartur should not be polluted, do we understand how much it costs to collect the water, convey it to the sewage treatment plants, treat it, and then dispose it off? Who is to pay the money? Taxpayer or consumer? Tough questions to ask, and that is not even part of the discussion. Have, are we discussing the true cost of water? Are we discussing what the price should be? Completely agree that it's, water is a human right. 50 liters per person per day free should be guaranteed. But 51st liter for washing the car, filling your swimming pool, putting it on your lungs, free or subsidized? Does it make sense? So somewhere we have to get into a compact where we capture the social cost or the human right of water and the economic cost of water and make sure that the BWS is be sustainable to be able to do its job well. But then we must then hold it accountable for perfect jobs. Khandita, but there have been, uh, Ashwini, a lot of uh, study done, the CWCB has a report. So in terms of every um, reservoir design, you create something called a dead storage. If you've crossed the dead storage, we have to worry. Uh, the silt above the sluice gate from where it is there. So all reservoirs calculate some for some silt load. Some reservoirs are exceeding the silt load, right? Mm -hmm. Now we have to figure out how we need to desilt the reservoir. One way is to push it down the river itself. Because the delta needs the silt, the river needs the silt, right? It's not just a question of us desilting it. Mm -hmm. Can we be smart in designing silt removal during floods? It's a question we have to, and we have to design it differently, right? Mm -hmm. Who's asking the question? Where is the expertise? 
are we doing it? Do we want to do it? Or is it just a matter of discussion all the time is a question we have done. We are always a step behind the problem that we are facing, not even one, two or three phases. So that's the optics of uh, crisis management. Optics, not optimism, optics of crisis management. If the groundwater table has collapsed, the borewell you drill will not get water. You will get a bill for the borewell, but you wouldn't get water. If the borewell gets water, it will deprive the surrounding borewells of water, so the net grain for the community is zero. In some cases, it may be of help, right? You may tap into an aquifer which has not been tapped and you may get additional water. But broadly, that is not the way to go. The way to go is to make sure that the aquifers are filled so that the existing borewells have water. And look at what the discussions we have. We talk about the government borewells, 15,000 or 13,000 uh, of which 6,900 are dry. There are 5 lakh borewells in private uh, hands. We are not talking about 5 lakh borewells, how many of them are dry? If we fill the aquifers, all those 5 lakh borewells will come back to life. At one estimate, each borewell now, if it to be drug afresh, costs 2 lakh rupees. 5 lakh borewells into 2 lakh rupees is 10,000 crores, which is private capital invested for water. Dysfunctional because the groundwater table has collapsed. So if you want to bring that 10,000 crores back to life as live capital, you need to fill the aquifers, not to drill more borewells. We have to do rainwater harvesting at large scale. We have to make sure that on the ridge lines and every apartment building, it pushes down water. We have to desilt our lakes and keep it fresh for rainwater to fill it so that it recharges. We have to protect the lakes in the periphery so that they also hold water and percolate into it. Only then will the benefit of the monsoon be real. Otherwise, it will be ephemeral. For some time, you will see benefits of the aquifer and then it will go dry quickly. The soil is in such deficit that the first few rains will only be absorbed by the soil to make for soil moisture deficit. So we will need now at least a 100 millimeter continuous rainfall of 2-3 days for it to start to reach the aquifer. That's a different story altogether. The floods are all localized flooding. Say for example, if Belandur and Vartur are ready to receive the rains, then they will stop the flooding in that area. But there are other localized floodings which have been ca caused by roads cutting across hydraulic lines, roads being raised so that houses are below the roads. Those problems will remain. Um, we have to get smart about that. There will be localized water logging, not flooding. So in the solution to the floods is the solution to groundwater management, right? So if we are able to collect all the rain, now what does the rainwater harvesting bylaw mandate for Bangalore? It says for every square meter of roof area, you have to collect 60 liters of water which means 60 millimeters of rain has to be tapped by every individual building. If 60 millimeters of rain is tapped by every building in Bangalore, there will be no floods. So that's, that's how it's been drawn. If there is excess water on the roads and in open spaces, that has to lead to the lakes, for which you need to make investment that sewage is collected and sewage does not run in stormwater drains. Right? So you need sewage network. So it's a comprehensive thing. If you want to control floods, we need to invest in sewage networks. Sir, the hell does it matter if somebody in Whitefield doesn't uh, um, uh, get water and if he's saying that. And also the sense of the outsider and us. If I'm con confident if some, and also this is the part of the dialogue and discussion also. Somebody from outside said, I have to use wet wipes for, too bad for you man, bye bye. That's our attitude that we have. That we, uh, RERA is giving approval for buildings outside the BMA jurisdiction. State environmental authority is giving approval for buildings and large constructions. On what basis? What are they showing for water management, water use? How are you, the same wings of the different wings of the government are giving permission for all sorts of construction everywhere. And then those fellows who are paying one crore or two crores for a building, don't you ask what is the sustainable source of water? Where am I going to get my water from? Don't you ask that? And then how do you hold accountable? If 
if you're spending that money, it's caveat emptor. You have to take care and be assured that you'll get water. Otherwise, then to cry that the state has to give me water, BWS has to give me water is, un is unfortunate. So the one thing is, please don't wash your cars with hose pipes, <laughs> do it with a bucket and a mug. Please don't wash the whole footpath and road and put rangoli, just do that in that two feet patch <laughs> and just sweep it. Be mindful about water use, try to share, if you have water, share it with, especially birds and other animals, you know, put a bowl of water so that there's water there. Realize how privileged you are if you're getting water in your tap, right, and be mindful about it. Put water aerators so that if the maid comes and she's not as mindful because she doesn't have to be, that she doesn't get to use, overuse water. Work with uh, people, use a full washing machine, all that we need to get mindful about it. But most importantly, push the state to take its responsibility and get you your rights. No, it's not about us alone, it's about the institutions of the state who we elect to deliver, who are not delivering, hold them accountable. And you're getting to vote very quickly. Please make sure that you use your vote wisely. <laughs> so water is money? Water is life, no? Water is money, for sure. Water is money. And, and the, the thing is that if you allow the tanker business to get beyond 25 to 30 percent supply, then they will capture the market. They will work very strongly to make sure that infrastructure doesn't come to your place. Your infrastructure should keep expanding so that they're just at the 20% level and they don't become the major player in the business. Chennai found that out the sad way. Let's not get down, get down that route and then do it. And ultimately, Bangalore has also been a can-do city, which is what I say, that we have enough and more, for want of a better word, intellectual firepower to be able to address the problems, right? We need, th those intellectuals now need to not just point fingers at problems, but fix the institutions which will fix our problems. Not fix the problems ourselves, but fix those institutions which will fix our problems. That's what we should all work for. Enough and more litany of problems that we list out, how do we overcome this and get that structural change which will give us sustainability is the million dollar question. Yes. Alba. Kandita, and I think we must ask and demand and cry and make as much kalata as is possible to say no. I'll do my bit, but the bigger bit is yours. The, you must do the bigger bit. See, you, we're easily seduced by solutions like make it out. That's the kind of dialogue that, and discourse that we get into. Um, how do we overcome that is also a question that we have to answer.